<laughs> well, you have to have a passion. You have to have okay. the passion. And let me tell you, if, if you had told me 30 years ago I'd be coaching in college, I would say you're absolutely correct. That was my future, but I thought it would have been baseball. Oh, really? <laughs> absolutely. Awesome. Anybody who knows, like my brothers kid me all the time because we all grew up as Yankee fans and, and avid ball players. <laughs> We were playing tons, and then I got introduced to fencing, and everything went a different direction. Different direction. I don't know the way it goes. But But you find that that the, the crossover between fencing and baseball is a mm. really good crossover. Interesting. Okay? Interesting. Um, especially because I was a catcher, and a catcher is constantly thinking. Okay, he's out sure. thinking. He's out thinking the offense. He's uh -huh. setting up the defense. Uh -huh. He's managing the pitcher. He's observing what each batter has done, and then he's finding the antidote to the strength of the hitter. Yes, sir. Well, that's essentially what a saber fencer does. Oh, right. right. Mm -hmm. And then you see, just like in baseball, there are these lulls where the thought process is going on. Mm -hmm. And then there's this quick action where you're implementing the plan. <laughs> that's that saber. Mm. Come to the line. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the saying I always had, and there's differences in the weapons, but in saber... You think from the minute they say halt mm -hmm. to the minute they say fence. Hmm. And in the other weapons, you think from the minute they say fence until the minute they say halt. halt. And interesting. Very interesting That's right there. All, all the thought process in Saber. <laughs> it's a constant recalculation. Mm. And then the other thing we find is just like a kid, depending on their physical gifts mm -hmm. or their, their attitude towards the sport, There are natural pitchers, mm -hmm. right? right? There are natural outfielders. There are natural corner men, mm -hmm. okay? natural catchers, mm -hmm. right? The personality dictates the position. Well, in fencing, the personality dictates the weapon. Or as the saying goes, you don't choose the weapon. The weapon chooses you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So when I got involved in the sport, I started in foil, and foil, if you've ever seen a fencing match, it's the one where they wear just the vest, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And it's a point weapon, and the idea is to hit the vest to set off the light cleanly, okay? Mm -hmm. I did it. I was fairly competent at it, but it was something I was holding. When I picked up a saber for the first time, it felt like a part of my arm this this is it this exactly uh -huh. it was the same feeling natural as when you get you natural. get the right when you get the right weight of a bat and the right balance mm -hmm. right and you swing and you hit you don't even feel it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right you can't describe that to anybody right wow <laughs> I, i love this i love okay? this and the focus is the same when you enter a bat a batter's box and you are focused There's no sound. Hmm. You don't hear the sound, right? Mm -hmm. You hear your thoughts, but you don't hear the crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, in mm -hmm. fencing, it's the same thing. Correct. If you hear the crowd, you're not focused enough. You're not. You're not. You're not going to do anything. <laughs> you're going to lose right away. <laughs> right. With, right. Without a question, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and this is fascinating because you know your story. I mean, I I, I like something that we're going to touch base later on, but. I know you part, you're still active yeah. participating in the Pan Americans. I love this from that coach. I, 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 are we going to go over through, through some, some of those uh, stories from you? But uh, before this, let me jump in on your history because you have an unbelievable record and over 300 win with the University of Drew University since 2014 that you start, right? That's when you took over uh, um, the, the university right there. And then you have 
a, you are the only coach to lead two high school teams to the prestigious Santelli Championship. So before you did that, um, you know, because I want to go, you know, when, when we do this and we we're going to talk about recruiting, we're going to talk about your school, we're going to learn about fencing, we're going to touch a lot of bases on that. But before this, I want to get to know you a little bit more personally, right? Okay. I want to, I want you to tell me how everything started. I know you are playing baseball, your family will play baseball, but what is it the cat, when, when, because when you mentioned, you know, what is it the cat, you, your attention on fencing and how you start, you know, at, at what age you start pretty much? Well, I, I'm a, I appreciate that. I, it's an unusual story and you have to understand mm -hmm. that I started coaching baseball, mm -hmm. played through, through uh, college and I started coaching baseball in 1976. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I loved it. I was coached the high school level or the middle school level and, and, and that. So we had kids. It was really, it was a natural. I was going to coach them through little league. I was going to coach them through junior, through mm -hmm. the baseball teams and the whole thing. Well, one year when my son, my oldest was, uh, I think seventh or eighth grade. We, I was coaching him in spring baseball, summer baseball, fall baseball. Mm -hmm. He had played about 150 games that year. Okay? <laughs> and I was coaching all his games. I was coaching my daughters. One daughter was still playing baseball and the other daughter was playing softball. Mm -hmm. So the joke was we never ate at home. It was always a hot dog at the hot dog stand at the ballpark. <laughs> and we, we come home and it is, and I still remember the day. It was November 1st. He had played his last fall game on Halloween on October 31st. He sits down at the computer in our family room basement. And he gets on his computer and he says, great, now I'll get to play all my favorite video games until next spring. Well, my <laughs> wife hears that. She goes crazy. And she oh, does God. not want him on the, on the computer all winter. <laughs> The local YMCA bullet, right? And she throws it down on the computer table. I don't care what you do. Pick some sport out of this folder. And that's what you're going to do this winter. You must do it at least three days a week. She says, I don't care. Otherwise, I'm shutting that computer off. P.S. He looked at it. We had just seen one of the old Star Wars movies. So mm -hmm. he sees fencing, he mm -hmm. goes, aha, I want to give that a try. <laughs> and so I take him to his first lesson over at the over at the local YMCA. And I see them, and I'm watching the movements. And the movements are the same movements that an infielder makes hmm. on his approach to the ball. Mm. And I see the, the one-handed side, and I'm going, that's a baseball stroke. Interesting. And at the end of the lesson, I go up to his, his coach, who was coaching a high school team. And the I asked the coach, what do you think? And I figured the guy's going to say, okay, he's good. Come back next week. He goes, no. How long has he been doing this sport? I said, no, this is his first lesson. He goes, the coach goes, no. This looks like a kid that's been at it for, for a while. He's a natural. He started taking him for these lessons. And I'm accompanying him every – and there, it was to the point where he was going to play – he was – don't want to do weight training or running or something till six. And then I'm running over and taking him to the fencing club and he's coming and I'm watching him at the fencing club. And I'm looking at it. I'm going, that looks like fun. Okay. <laughs> then I start taking him around to these little local tournaments mm -hmm. and he starts doing really well. He was getting and better he's and having better. fun. Right, awesome. And so I go up to his coach one day and I go, could I try a lesson? <laughs> and he goes yeah you could try a lesson and what am i i'm i'm in my late 30s early 40s and um puts a weapon and puts a foil in my hand and i'm trying it and i'm really enjoying it and after an hour i am sweating i am telling you it looked like i had jumped in a swimming pool <laughs> and um and i tried it and after about a month of this the coach says why don't you go to a local tournament so I mm -hmm. take my son to the local tournament. I register. 
I'm up against all these kids, right? <laughs> and I'm winning. It's... Okay. So the next tournament I go to, I register for my age group and I'm winning there. And then, <laughs> then about a couple of months in, I pick up a saber for the first time and it was like a light went off. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden now I'm fencing with this saber and I'm winning local tournaments and I'm placing in regional tournaments and I qualify for the summer national championships oh my God. And going. Mm. And I'm literally taking my son to these events. <laughs> so, you know, we get on an airplane or we get in the car and there are these two guys with these fencing bags and he'll enter his tournaments. I enter mine. P.S. He gets to his, his uh, sophomore year in high school. Mm-hmm. He, for freshman year, he qualifies as an independent in the state championship. And I'm coaching along the way. Second year, he switches to Sabre just like me. Mm-hmm. And I coach him in the state individual championship in Sabre. <laughs> so I see a bunch of families at the club and I go, why don't we see if the local board of ed will let us have a team? And so, okay, we go to the board of ed and it was an odd discussion because once I started researching and I started finding out that all these great colleges have fencing and they have mm-hmm. spots that are empty. Mm-hmm. So instead of promoting it, look, here's a sport, another sport to add to your list. Mm-hmm. I started promoting it with these other parents. Look, Excellent. we want our kids to get into better schools. Yes. This is a sport that gets into better schools. Never was awesome. a thought towards scholarship. Always with a thought towards a better education. But there you are. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they mm-hmm. they go to they they we put on a demo at the local board of ed. My son makes one cut on on a, one of his friends, and hits the blade, and then the blade strikes the other blade, and sparks jump off. Mm. The minute the sparks jump off, all you could see all the eyes on the individual board members wide open, and they. We had it at that point. And they said, nice. okay, who are you going to get to coach? And we go, I'm <laughs> no, it was like this. I'm, <laughs> I'm it. So within four years, we start the team, his beginning of his junior year. Uh, he plays on it for two years. Uh, he makes the state championships. He becomes district champ. Within four years of us starting it, we have a state championship. The mm. team, we have a state championship. My little yeah. one comes across. My, my, you know, my youngest comes through the mm-hmm. system. And by that point, they've now changed the rule. And the rule is parents cannot coach their own kids. Oh. And they passed that rule. <laughs> like nine coaches, myself included, had to be let go. So here I am. I got no, no place to coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I hear about a local high school a com- that is looking to start a fencing team. So the parent that's in charge calls me. I explain my advice, you know, how I got the one. We go through and we put through at that school, the school's name is Governor Livingston High School, and they hire me to be their head coach to start a program from scratch. I didn't know nice. anybody in the town. <laughs> start the program within four years. We went from start up again to it state champs. On the way, beat my daughter's team mm. in a playoff round. And the- okay, <laughs> you had to see it. And meanwhile, now I'm taking my, my, my son goes off to college. He's fencing to college. My daughter's coming through this, our system. So I'm, I'm training my high school team till seven or eight o'clock at night, uh-huh. coming home, picking my daughter up and training her till 10 o'clock at night. Oh my. Wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm like, actually going, and I go through all this and um, eventually I go back after about seven or eight years. My kids have cleared the system. I go back to my original, the original high school, Bernard's high school, and win a Santelli championship with them. Mm. Now comes uh, uh, spring of 2014. And like I'm doing national competitions. I just qualified to do the Pan Am Games in Aruba. Um, and uh, a friend of mine who is the local coach at Drew says he's you know he's been there 19 years he says why don't you come out and work out with our college guys Mm. and you can prepare for the pan am games and maybe if you like it you'll stay in the fall and be my assistant coach oh there you are (laughs) 
That was it. I started showing up and I started playing his saber fencers. And after a week or two, I'm beating these college kids. Okay. Well, lo and behold, I start the 14 15 season because it starts in September and goes to March. I start the 14 season, uh, September 14 as an assistant coach. We get to January 15. He decides he's going to retire. His divorce is he, his divorce becomes final. Uh-huh. He, hands, he, he hands me the key and he goes, "Here, it's yours. Um, it's all yours." <laughs> ha, 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 ha. And I start, and that was the beginning. And I never left the position. They hired me on full time after that. Excellent. And Excellent. there we go. And my first recruiting class. Th- at that point, the team had kind of whittled down. My first recruiting class, I brought in 28 people. 28 I recruited people. 28 because I went mm-hmm. back to all my high school contacts mm-hmm. and having been a high school coach. And I went to all these guys and said, look, do you have any uh, aspiring players that want to stay in state mm-hmm. and still want to fence? Mm-hmm. Now, eventually, after you know, I had cl- recruiting classes of 28, 24, 18, 36, mm-hmm. we now have the largest team in Division Three with the exception of one other, and there's mm-hmm. a reason for that, but we're the, the largest team that practices together. Like every practice are all my players. Excellent. Excellent. So that's the story. And I just, I kept <laughs> going. And then the, what a normal recruiting looks like mm-hmm. is the kid coming out and sparring me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a really unusual. In fact, I've got something coming in this fall, mm-hmm. who I actually met when they were competing in the Pan American Games uh, in the youth division, and mm-hmm. I was competing in the veteran division. And mm-hmm. one night I saw the parents in the restaurant and we just started talking. It's, <laughs> so, that's beautiful. You know, when you when you can go out there and, and do that, it's it's it adds another dimension. Because when you think like a player, you think like a player, excuse me. If you think like a player, thinking like a player is different than thinking like a coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What's the difference? What's the difference right there? Because, I mean, you're active too, and you're coaching. So, so when you are competing, are you coaching yourself as well? You are. You are. When you coach a sport, you are thinking what your players should do. Mm. Mm -hmm. when you are competing in a sport you're thinking of what the opponent's about to do Mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful okay you just have to turn the psychology just switch just switch that now what happened with your son so he stopped completely playing baseball he went full-time fencing he ended up he ended up going to um that's the funny part he ended up getting into princeton Mm. to fence Mm -hmm. and chose not to go to princeton Oh, are you kidding me? Chose not to go to Princeton. My wife and I had both gone to Rutgers, which is a competing school. Uh-huh. And we were heartbroken. <laughs> and he chose instead to go to a small college by, uh, in North Jersey that had fencing. Mm-hmm. And his rationale was that he liked the head coach. And he said to me, Dad, the head coach is who I'm going to spend the most time with over my four years. He's the professor I'm going to spend the most time with. Excellent. Excellent. I have to like the guy. Mm. And I go, you know what? That's that's fine. But what about going to an Ivy League school? He says, don't worry, Dad. I have to go to grad school anyway. I'll go to an Ivy League grad school. P.S. He went to this small college, fenced for them. Uh, one, you know, made the NCAA champion, you know, the NCAA regionals. Mm-hmm. Had an excellent time in a Division three school. Studied hard. And he got his PhD from Yale. From Yale, wow, excellent. So excellent. my baby, the one that the one that I coached for and against, mm-hmm. ended up uh, getting into UPenn. UPenn, and okay. Fencing mm-hmm. for them and making the NCAA finals excellent. with them. That's 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 rewarding. That's extremely okay. rewarding, right there. That's beautiful. So you're dealing with a situation where. It, it worked both ways. Mm-hmm. You know, my daughter went to Division One, and mm-hmm. it was highly competitive. And, and 
my son went division three and it was still competitive but it was a different mindset on a division three team. division three. and it's we, and it matched their personalities we're gonna go over that because i know you compete against d1 schools constantly i mean last last uh season i mean you have uh saint john's which is a division one you have lafayette division one you have sacred new jersey heart. yeah sacred, sacred heart division one you have new jersey institute uh of technology that's a division one so that's and, and last year uh -huh. we, before the covid closures we had northwestern division one there you are uh, -huh. uh upenn division you one notre dame Defending Those are national, I, 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 national Ivy champs. schools, Ivy schools. So you compete against us, even the you are division three. So that's that's very interesting because you know people probably would not know that, you know, when it comes to recruiting. When I when I when I encounter foreign students, and I actually lost a recruit this year mm -hmm. to another school that was division one for no other reason than he thought that division one was like in soccer, division one team in soccer is better than a division three team mm -hmm. in international soccer. And this player mm -hmm. was coming from France. Mm -hmm. And they and, and I try to get it through his head that the division one team he went, was going to, that he's going to be out in the fall, mm -hmm. we had beaten eight out of eight times <laughs> in my tenure at Drew University. <laughs> well, he's so going to be hurt. Be division one, <laughs> but we've kicked its butt. Yeah, consistently. Yeah. He's gonna be hard. <laughs> and he's got a target on his back right now because my coaches are saying that you know what? After um after that recruiting experience, we want to mm -hmm. actually show him what a division three what the division three is look like. You know, that's fascinating because you know you talk about international athletes, we're gonna go talk about that. But let's let's talk national, okay? Okay. Uh, because tell me, when people, you're, tell me when we're on. Yeah, because a lot of people, you know, is is you mentioned something important. I mean, that that just happen in soccer. You say, you know, people think the soccer, you know, is high level, lower level. I seen you know college uh, uh, playing against D twos, against D ones, and they beat them as well. You know, so it, that is the mentality that people have. You know, yes, Division One, of course, is. It's prestigious. It's, it's, it's extremely competitive. Most definitely when it comes to football, to basketball, baseball, soccer, you see difference. You see difference between the athletes, right? The competition is, is, is way more competitive without a question. But in some sports, like in your case, fencing, it's not that case. It's not the case. And, and the mentality is, oh, no. You know, I want to go to Yale. I want to go to St. John's. I want to go to Harvard. I want to go to... They never think about Division Three. And, and I mentioned to you on our conversation on Sunday over the phone, one of the things that I like the most, and I'm, I'm passionate about Division Three because one of the things that I like the most, which I didn't grow up that way, going towards that way, because I always grew up playing sports, right? My brother, my, my cousins... You know, everybody would play baseball, 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 baseball. That, so, so I never grew up being an academic type athlete. I was right. more of, of the athletics. But when I got to know more about recruiting, I got to know more about college in the United States. You know, after a few years of practicing and, and going uh, to presentations and talking to athletes and parents, I got to know that Division Three. if you take a look, you can Google that. Division Three out of the top 100 universities in the United States, 74 are Division Three. When we talk about academics, okay, not, com not talking about competitive sports, we're talking about academics. Right. So why is it that if you have a good GPA, right? I have a good GPA, you always focusing on going on division one and not division three. Why is that culture? This is one of the reasons why I'm inviting you. And this is the reason why we bring in this valuable information to student athletes and parents is because we have to consider all divisions. So why is it that we don't consider this type of division when it comes to parents and when it comes to athletes? Because it's both, not just one. So you a coach, you tell me how that goes. 
what you're looking at is summed up in one word mm -hmm. football there you are okay mm -hmm. one word football football maybe two words basketball mm -hmm. the two money sports the money yeah the money makers because those are the ones on television mm -hmm. and those are the ones you hear the name over and over again those are the mm -hmm. ones that are associated mm -hmm. with the sport and that is for many colleges that's the those are the only two money making Mm -hmm. sports that they have you might Correct. get an occasional school that sells out its baseball games like miami or ucla or usc or mm -hmm. stanford mm -hmm. for the most part the economics of it uh are through the television revenue mm -hmm. the television revenue on college football is phenomenal it's phenomenal yeah so now the kid grows up and he says okay those are in essence you know those schools mm -hmm. yeah that doesn't mean that in some of the sports, that they have that equal weight of presence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, all funding, all funding as well. More funding. Actually, mm -hmm. we're better funded than that Division One school I was telling you about that the kid from <laughs> France went to. Yeah. I know mm -hmm. because I actually took a look at that job a number of years ago, and I'm going for the amount of time they're going to make me put in doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of programs, especially in fencing, are Division I in name only. Mm. And the reason is the Division I rules says that they must field a certain number of teams in Division I to hold Division I status. Mm -hmm. So for the sake of football or for the sake of basketball, they have all these other sports that they underfund but call mm -hmm. Division I. Correct. Mm -hmm. you and I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of schools that have no business calling themselves Division One, really in certain sports. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't speak to my opponents. My, my opponents are quality opponents. Mm -hmm. but they're no, for the most part, on any given day, we can give them a run for their money. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do you know what I mean? I, I understand. I understand. Okay. And that's that's the desire. Now, I can't argue with the Ivy Leagues. Definitely. But really, when you come down to it, and I can't argue for the one or two elite programs that produce Olympic athletes. But mm -hmm. when we tell our recruits, for the most part, you're gonna be a pro you're gonna be a professional when you get out of our program. You're just not gonna be a professional fencer. There Thank aren't you. There aren't professional fencers. Mm -hmm. What there are are kids that have learned school mm -hmm. skills that will turn them in, into professionals at something else. Extremely, yeah. You're going to have okay. a good, good degree, a good education, which is... Well, you've also been involved in a team. Now, a lot of fencers at the scholastic level don't mm -hmm. have even have high school teams. Mm -hmm. So if they compete in the regional or the local circuits. They're competing alone. Mm -hmm. So we teach them or we refine for the ones that did have a high school team uh how to function in a team how to be responsible for the the growth of the team how to be a good mm -hmm. teammate how, mm -hmm. even something as simple as how to travel with teammates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. how to self-motivate how to you know you get it how to uh handle a dispute resolution mm -hmm. with a teammate mm -hmm. you know creating that little healthy rivalry within the team that doesn't become destructive. All of those are skills you're going to use no matter what business you're going to go into. Without a question. Without okay. a question. Mm -hmm. Then you start looking at the, the quantum of these scholarships mm -hmm. and the requirements that they have. Like, for example, Division three has a limit on the number of hours that you can have team mandated activities per week. Mm -hmm. as a limit on the number of days. Mm -hmm. Now, that's for official activities. Mm -hmm. If my kids want to go lift weights on their own time, they can do it. They can do it. Monitored, yeah. unrecorded, mm -hmm. no punishment mm -hmm. if they don't. But mm -hmm. they self-motivate to do that. Mm -hmm. Division one has virtually no limit. There you okay? Are. Mm -hmm. So now, where my kids are spending 20 to 25 hours a week, on team-related activity besides competition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Just that, within the school, within the school, you practice all that. That Division One player may be spending an additional fifteen hours. A week. Fifteen hours. They yeah. might have might be up to forty hours a week. Now, mm -hmm. take now. You think, okay, well, they're getting a scholarship. Well, those scholarships, on average, are under five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. They would be better off for that additional fifteen hours working at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. They would sir. make more money working at McDonald's <laughs> than they would for the additional time. And mind you, we're playing the same opponents. We're even playing each other. Yes. The same opponents. In a lot of cases, we're in the same conferences. Mm -hmm. we're, we're actually in Division Three. We have a better travel schedule. Mm. Because we on the East Coast, all the Division Threes are really compressed. Mm -hmm. To the point where the furthest we are, like if we go up to Boston, it's a five-hour bus ride. Big mm -hmm. deal. You can do that in one overnight. In one overnight. Some of those Division ones are going from North Carolina up to Michigan. Yes. And they're not flying. Mm -hmm. They're on a bus for 11, 12, 14 hours. Yes. Going to an event may ruin them for two or three days. Yes. Where my kids are going up, most of our stuff, the bulk is within a three-hour bus ride. There you are. There you are. Okay. Who's got the better lifestyle? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no questions asked. You and know, then my my son's maxim. My son's maxim. Hey, Dad. Um. You know, I, I the coach is the one I'm going to spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So I've got to like him. You know, I I like I love that because um you know through the podcast I had the opportunity to talk to. A lot of coaches and you know some of the coaches would talk about culture some of the coaches you know we talk about what is it that we can do to to impress a kid right and and what are you saying is is that your kid did is extremely important because some coaches would come to me and say i i'm going to have a learn term relationship with this person so i need to have a good connection with this person, not just because he's good or she's good, not just because she's, you know, she has a good GPA. I need to have the chemistry with it, with it, you know? So, so maybe you, you some pass on the division one, got very good school, but the connection with the coach, that's what changes, you know, his right. opinion is right. really important. Get to know the coach and get to know the school before you make a commitment. Without a question. Correct. And and he bonded there. And I've carried that lesson into when I talk to players. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting thing is when I talk to players, especially in the Zoom era, talk to their parents too. Mm -hmm. I have the parents in the discussion because you can tell a lot about the dynamic of the kid to the parent. Because in many times, that dynamic is going to translate to how they view the coach. They mm -hmm. will either treat be in the relationship with the coach because of the relationship that they had with their parent or in spite of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? they have a great relationship with the parent they will expect that with the coach if they have a hard relationship with the parent then they're basically running to the coach as a more comforting parent mm -hmm. so you watch that dynamic is the kid independent? If I ask the kid a question, if the parent jumps in giving the answer, mm -hmm. uh, nah. that kid's been sheltered. Okay? Mm -hmm. And don't forget, you know, the kid will call home. The kid will, the kid will go home at times. Yeah. So what I do with that kid over the course of months, that parent can undo in the course of minutes mm -hmm. if we're not on the same page. If you're not on the same page, be a sir. It's important. It's important. You know, I, I, I got a couple athletes actually that um, is, you know, most of the parents will come to me, like I mentioned, and they always say, you know, it's not because of my kid, because, of, you know, it's not because it's my son or my daughter. And, and it's very interesting when it comes to uh, a division three, because there is only two parents in eight years span that I've been working on this. They come to me and say, I want my kid to go to a division three. Only two parents in eight years span, you know, and 
uh, they have great, they save a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. I, we're going to clarify this because you mentioned on our conversation, we uh, on Sunday, you don't give athletic scholarship. You don't have athletic scholarships. It's academic scholarships. It's financial aid that you have in order for the kid to be within your school. That doesn't mean that you don't need them. You still need the athlete. You still need the athletes without a question, but you have to have the requirements. So when it comes to the, the requirements, gotta be up there. There you are. So when it comes to that, Drew University, what's the average that that you, as a recruiter, as a head coach, as a fencing, will look on an athlete? What 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 is the first thing you will see on an athlete before you make you you have like a decision to make? Or before you say, okay, this is it. I like this kid from. Florida, or like this kid from, I don't know, uh, uh, France, you know, you you have to make a decision as head coach. What's the first thing you would see on an athlete right there? First, I got to know, are they admissible? So I got to look at the GPA. Mm -hmm. And we're a test optional school, but it helps to look at the test score. They're done Mm -hmm. by test score. Mm -hmm. On a foreign student, we look at the TOEFL. TOEFL. The Mm -hmm. T-O-E-F-L. Yes, sir. Um, Mm -hmm. And I generally will have our international admissions officer who's based in Europe talk to them, no matter where they're located, just Mm -hmm. to get a feel for the the family and to let them know a little more about the uh, about being a foreign exchange student or coming in as a Mm -hmm. foreign admit. Then I'll look at. Do they have do they fence the right weapon for my needs? Mm. And I ask an interesting question that I was told once by one of my admissions officers, you shouldn't ask, but I do need to ask. (laughs) What other schools are you looking at? I like that. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. What other schools are you looking at? You know, if they're looking at me and they're looking at all these high division one programs, but the kid doesn't have that great a score Mm -hmm. or that great a uh, fencing rating, I got to ask, what's the story here? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or if maybe they're there, we're the only fencing school they're looking at. They're looking at all the others for specialized programs. Mm-hmm. Want to know about that because that becomes a good point, a selling point. Like they've got the program, we've got the same program, but there they don't have fencing. Here we do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe I'm looking, am I up against the kid that's looking at all states? Mm-hmm. If he's logging at his all in state for whatever state they're from, then I know I can't compete with them on the dollars because they're going to get an in state in state tuition rate. Mm-hmm. But maybe, maybe they're from the Midwest mm-hmm. and they want to have something where they're near New York City mm-hmm. between New York and Philadelphia and have the advantage of the internships mm-hmm. that you wouldn't get in the Midwest. Correct. So I look at those main factors. Mm-hmm. I read every email they send. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Does that email tell me that they've already read up and done their homework on our program? Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did they reach out to me? Did they take the balls to reach out to me and mention something individual about my program? Or was that a, just a shotgun? You know that. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then the other, the last part about this is, is that have I seen them? There are times where because I'm doing these competitions myself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I will see these kids. Now, you're not allowed to talk to them during the events, and I mm-hmm. don't. But if I see them, I make a mental note. Yes, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good guide right there. So that's I'm there guide. on ground level. I'm not looking from the stands. I'm actually on the floor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes, sir. Excellent. And so those are the things I look at. And then if it's, and then if it's bona fide, you know, if they... And I don't need the A ranked, or I don't need the A or the triple A player. I don't need them. I would love them. And I have a bunch this year. This mm-hmm. year I have a bunch this year and coming into the fall. I'll take that middle level player if I think that I can improve. You can, yes, certainly, definitely. No questions. Okay? Mm-hmm. Because I got four years with them. So yeah. they come in raw their first year. I improve them their, by their sophomore year. They're ready to start maybe junior year. Hey, I've got, I've taken coal and I've mined it into diamond. Excellent. Excellent. Now, 
for those that, including myself, that don't know much about fencing. I know fencing. I mean, fencing has been around for since the 12th centuries. It's extremely old sport. People don't pay attention probably to fencing much. You know, I follow it's some. Been in, it's been in every Olympics. Mm -hmm. Every Olympics. It's the founding of the modern games. Yes. Yes, okay. it started. It started with the Italians, and then they went to you know, then the French will make better, and the Spanish from the 19th century started getting better and better on that. And in fact, people don't know, but the official language of fencing is French. It's French. They're the ones. They're the ones that codified it and 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 formalized the sport. I, yeah, you are. There you are. So, so most of us, like I say, including myself, you know, I didn't like have no knowledge of, of, of fencing. So when it comes to college, how many, how many guys oh, and girls, because you coach both, right? Uh, 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 how many people is in within your roster right there? Um, generally, the men's rosters, not only my school, but other schools are heavier than the women's rosters. Okay. It's very difficult to get good and I'm, I'm not saying ex excellent, but good quality female athletes. Mm. Okay, They're just, they're harder to come by. And in certain weapons, they're even harder than other weapons. Um, right uh, next year, we'll have approximately 40 men and approximately 20 women. Oh, wow. And the teams practice oh. together. Oh, they, they do? They okay. Separately, I but they practice together. Mm -hmm. Um. And what we do for our men's team is because we have so many guys, we actually play a double schedule. Mm. Like the NCAA tells us how many days we can compete. Okay. But not how many places we can compete on the same day. Mm. So like in baseball, they would, in a spring training, they'll do a split squad game. Yes. With the Yankees, a will oh, play the Red Sox. And the yes, Yankees sir. B will play the Marlins. <laughs> well, I do that. One group goes to one location, one group goes to the other on the men's team. Oh, interesting. Very nice. So I basically double our capability because I, I believe in the fact that kids learn by competing. That's mm. a valuable lesson, not yeah. just drills. Mm -hmm. right? And competing against people that are new to them. Mm. I like so, that. I like so that. That's how that's how we do it. We practice, and it's impressive when you see all sixty fencers in our facility at the same time mm -hmm. with the coaching staff and the way we run our drills. We do close. We do the only thing I can tell you is take your baseball exercises, mm -hmm. not your hitting exercises, uh -huh. but your baseball exercises. How it's set up on the field, how you run your sprints, how you run your timing, and I took all of that from all those years of coaching baseball. And put it into fencing. So I might I might be coachable in fencing then. You I might, might be coachable. <laughs> you might be. I might put it, I might put you in an outfit and, and it will seem strangely familiar. Really? <laughs> I, might, I you know what? As soon as I head to Yersley, I will let you know. I want I want to take a couple of lessons to see how it was. <laughs> I tell you what, you come out, what we we've done in the past. I did this when I was coaching in high school. So my first year there. One of the football players said to one of my kids, in fact, I think he told my son, oh, you got that's not a, really a sport. Mm. So for one of the first practices, we invited the football team to put on the gear. Uh -huh. well, after <laughs> about a half hour, these kids are gassed, and my <laughs> fencers are kicking their behinds. From that point on, the football players started coming to the fencing matches. <laughs> awesome. So, I like that. <laughs> so, yeah. You'll see. It's a real sport. Awesome. Awesome. I would love to see because, uh, you know, I, like I said, I like to learn more. You know, if, if it, I have never thought about fencing in my life, to be honest with you, but I, I seriously, I got to take you on and, that coach when I, when and I, I tell my son, and I tell my oh, son yeah. pulled out that YMCA booklet, neither <laughs> had I. Really, my wife put it on his desk. She changed everybody's lives in our family. Oh, awesome. Awesome. I'm just thankful he didn't choose something like basketball because at five seven, I don't have a future in basketball. <laughs> five seven, that's good. Well, I'm a little bit taller. I'm like six one, so I'm okay. Okay, well, you're, you're, you're point guard. <laughs> I can do point guard. No, I'm vertically. Have... I'm vertically challenged. 
Yeah. Now, you know, let's let's talk about, you know, a little bit about, you know, because you have an outstanding record, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, the 2021, of course, the season got cut because of COVID. Uh, you had a record, you know, between the three, the last three years, you have 50, you know, on 2018, you have 41 and 13 with the men's, you have 42 and 11 with the girls. And on 2019, 2020, uh, uh, 2019, 20, you have 59 and 19 with the men's and 46 and 18 with the girls. And then Kobe hit and, you know, short season, you only have what? In, in those two years, 19 by games. the way, 19 games. those two years, we were the top. We had more wins than any team in the country. Oh, really? Look at that. Look at that. Any team in the country. No matter what division is. No matter what division is. Mm. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. A little team in a beautiful, in a beautiful town in North Jersey. <laughs> I mean, you know, and we used to kid, we used to kid them. Like they didn't know who we were until we showed up and they knew who we were. <laughs> oh, they know the, the excellent. They know who Drew is beautiful yeah. because your school is not a big school. Your school is is, is, is well, a good. Um, I would say what eighteen hundred students. Yeah, if you include if yes, if you include the graduate students, a mm -hmm. small graduate student class, it's about eighteen hundred to two. About eighteen hundred, right? Yeah. But we're on a train line to Midtown Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Forty-two minutes by direct train. Uh, we are in the richest territory in North Jersey. The houses, million, couple of million dollar houses, all surrounding. Mm -hmm. In the town that's ranked by New Jersey Monthly Magazine, the number one town in the state. Interesting. Okay. Beautiful. We have around us every top pharmaceutical firm in the world, mm -hmm. as well as top medical offices. Mm -hmm. um, we use the proximity to New York City for all of our internship and graduate programs. And the kids can still fence and do those programs. Do the programs work. end at three. Mm -hmm. And they get on the train and they're to me by practice time. 40 so, minutes, 40 minutes, they'll be there. 40 minutes. That's it. That's it. So it's a and great location. It's yeah, a beautiful it's, location. With beautiful location. It's a this spectacular that, Yeah, but a lot of people. town. Yes. See, a lot of people don't know that. So it's good to know that way we can, you know, promote that, you know, in order for people to get to know more about the university. It's, it's, it's among the richest towns in the country. Excellent. Okay. Um, Excellent. And the, the lifestyle, it's a very suburban lifestyle, but I mean, the other advantage our school has, and don't take this the wrong way, we don't mm -hmm. have football, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which means we don't get drowned out by all the football breaks. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on my campus, the other teams that play for our school play in a very small division three only conference. And it's a good conference and they're very good small schools and that has its place. We're the one team that's not in that conference. In that conference. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you hear these other teams playing Muhlenberg or, or Susquehanna, mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. Then you hear us playing Notre Dame. Notre Dame, yeah. Or Army or Navy Love. Love. or, <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? Yes. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. And we've been there almost a century. We've been playing. We've been that this season was the 91st season for the team. 91st season. Wow. 91st. At the university. At the university. Wow. At the university. And because we competed this season when some other teams did not, the older mm -hmm. teams did not, we can now say we are the oldest continuously operating program in the country. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> that was the goal this year. We That's the goal. One match, and we did better than that. We brought in what we have eight All Americans. Eight All Americans. There you are. There you are. Nobody else has done that. Mm. No, none of the Division Threes have done that before. Yeah. Beautiful. You see, that that that. This is something that's extremely important for people to get to know more about that. Now, COVID hit, and you know, unfortunately, we have to go over a little bit. Have anything changed nowadays? You know, I know that everything is changing because of the vaccine and everything, but does anything change by the comes to when it comes to recruiting? 
because of COVID. Well, still, you're still following some protocols right there. You're still concerned. What are, what are you guys doing on that? Well, this year, this year, a lot of events shut down. So our ability to see players was, was generally hampered. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. but most fencers have uh, videotapes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of uh, how they, how they uh, compete and we've been able to share those. Mm -hmm. um, it has also changed, it, it, just like everything else in life, we started using Zoom. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. interviewed the kids. If, you know, I must have done, in the last 12 months, I probably did 200 Zoom interviews. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer in person, but logistically, that would have been impossible. Impossible. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. I got to also tell you that we changed our coaching style during COVID mm -hmm. because we were playing and not able to scout competition. Mm -hmm. What we would do is everybody was on live stream mm -hmm. because there were no fans in the stands. Mm -hmm. So we looked ahead at our schedule and said, okay, which of our opponents in the future coming up later in the season mm -hmm. are on live stream? So we monitored their live streams and recorded them. There you are. And that as for our tape analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that each week we'd sit down with our players and we'd analyze tape like I used to do in baseball. <laughs> Beautiful. We'd go through and say, okay. And then we were, we, we routinely videotape our practices. And we'd mm -hmm. say, okay, see what you just did here and do it in slow motion. If you change this or you do that, and then we put it side by side with what the, their opponent did in another live stream, mm -hmm. say this will counteract that. So mm -hmm. we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. um, the other thing, too, is I have a very active summer camp. Okay. And that got shut down last summer. Th that got shut down. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. But this, this summer's camp, we knew that with the pandemic subsiding, mm -hmm. that People were going to be anxious to get out and do anything. Yes. And now our camp, we've had it. We've had the registration open two weeks. Mm -hmm. We're three quarters full. Three quarters full. Wow. Okay. It's like, it's amazing. And that becomes a good way for them to see how a college program operates because it's only college coaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ours and college coaches from a few other schools on our campus. And we get to see how they do. Not yeah. Not just the skill level, but how do they adapt to the lessons? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like a, it's it's a learning for both sides, mm -hmm. and that's where I do a good part of my recruiting is mm -hmm. through seeing them, and it's a legitimate way to work with them, and so do some mm -hmm. other coaches. The other thing that we do, and we couldn't do we couldn't do this season, but we're going to do again in the fall, is we run high school clinics. Okay, we will, we have a lot of high school within about seven uh, a 75 mile radius we have about a third of the high school teams in the country oh wow so we invite them in they pay for the clinic and we will instruct them on something mm -hmm. it gives us a chance to see them them to see our campus and to see us excellent and when you walk on our campus it sells it sells it just it just sells because it's gorgeous it's and um and then you know, you also have to remember that in fencing, other than the Olympic guys, mm -hmm. college coaches of any sort are top of the food chain. Mm -hmm. There is no professional fencing. There's no New right. York Yankees no fencing. Okay? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So once you take the Olympic guys out of it, college coaches are the next level. The ne definitely. Okay. Yes. But it's top of the food chain for 98% of all the fencers. The top coach they will ever have is a college coach. Is a college coach. So having these high schoolers interact with college coaches early on is a big draw. Beautiful, beautiful. You follow I, me. I like I like that. I like that culture though. I like that culture because you don't you don't see that happening in all the sports pretty much. You don't see it happening in all the sports now. And, and when it comes because fencing is more like at the east sports, right? Have you ever recruited a little bit more about in the West side as well, or, or how, how does that go? Have you ever come travel, like, like compete on the West Coast? Yes. 
Yes. I've competed. I've competed on the West Coast. Absolutely. I mm-hmm. competed uh, my and in the travels with my kids. Mm-hmm. I probably competed in Anaheim four or five times, San Diego a bunch of times, uh, San Francisco a bunch of times, mm. Al- uh, Albuquerque more times than anybody should be in Albuquerque. Um, <laughs> okay. And there is West Coast fencing. It's just because of the contraction of a lot of sports, mm-hmm. um, the West Coast now only has really the women's program at Stanford. Mm-hmm. And the men's and women's program at University of California, San Diego. Mm-hmm. You have to go, and then you have Air Force, mm-hmm. and then you have a team in Texas, UIW, and uh, University of the Incarnate Word, and then everything is pretty much around by the Mississippi River and east. Mm-hmm. 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 Now there is a move now to expand the sport in the West. Mm. We're looking to put you, together a here in Phoenix, you don't have no 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 fencing teams in Arizona. Huh? In Arizona, do you have fencing teams here? I don't. I don't. No, you have a club. It, it, there's a, by the way, there's a very active club circuit. I mean, club as in the school organizes the team under recreation, and they play other schools. Mm. But it's not varsity, it's and not it may be may be self coached by the players, or maybe the local. The local facility operator owns a club, We're club and he now. comes in and gives gives some time. So I think Arizona State has got a uh, had a collegiate club, collegiate club. Um, mm. But the varsity programs, no, no, nothing in Arizona. No, they don't. Um, do, they don't do that. Nothing in New Mexico. Texas has got just UIW as a collegiate program. Mm. Um, mm. You think have, you think in the future that that would change? Uh, uh, it, it has to. It has, it has to. to. It has to. I'm on the I'm on uh, the committee for the NCAA uh, USFCA, which is the coaches association, um, trying to expand the sport. And excellent. It, it's recognized that the way the sport is going to expand is at the Division three level. Mm. It's just like you took a look at the colleges, the great colleges, and you see how many of them are Division three. Mm-hmm. We take a look at the open ground. Mm-hmm. Where a, where a program can be promoted fairly inexpensively, mm-hmm. and there's so many more Division three schools. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. Um, yes. that that we look at that as fallow ground that you could you could put teams in, mm-hmm. um, and well, so I think that's where uh, that's where the expansion is going to occur. Mm. Well, count me in if you need any help on that. I'll promote that. You know, I help. I help as much as I can, <laughs> because I I, to, I I tell you something. ASU has the capacity to have a good team right there, without a question. It's a it's a great university. It's a, it's massive. It's I mean, I know. You know, and, and I, I live ten minutes away from ASU, and I tell you something. The, it, it keeps growing and growing and growing. The new uh, facilities. They, it's just unbelievable. It's a beautiful university. So if you have that capacity of growing that like that, you should have a fencing team. You should have, uh, you know, a, a soccer main team, which they don't have either. You know, uh, uh, they they should start implementing more sports into this university because what it's going to take is you're never going to get one school. Mm. You always need two schools. You need two school. Yeah. You got to create that. Like when when baseball moved from the East Coast, professional baseball moved to California, mm-hmm. they couldn't do just one professional team. They had to do two. Mm-hmm. Had to be the John Dodgers and Giants going. Yeah, because yeah. they had to create that mm-hmm. that that so they could at least play each other. So Arizona yes. State really needs other nearby schools. Well, they have if they had the one in San Diego, it's not that far from here, but. It's still yeah, it's right, you know that maybe they they can use a, 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 the one in Tucson, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. It's true. It's true. There's so, not too many universities here in the states, uh, to be honest. It's a small when it comes to that. It's a small. It's a small community right there because yeah. We, but I, I take a place like Texas, which has got a lot Texas. of clubs, yes. a lot of private clubs, mm-hmm. and you know, University of Houston should have it. You know, mm-hmm. North mm-hmm. Texas State should have it. Those types of places, you could create a conference just out of the colleges in Texas. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Florida, the same deal. Now, Florida has a phenomenal club program uh, at University of Florida. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. It's as big as any varsity team, but it's not run through their athletic office, but mm -hmm. it does get some assistance from it because it, Florida's in the SEC, mm -hmm. and that makes a lot of money off of football and basketball. Mm -hmm. There you are. So it filters down. But you could take Florida, Florida State, and a bunch of those other schools and put it together with all these private clubs. We have the advantage that the, the corridor from uh, basically from New York to Washington, D.C. is loaded with hundreds of fencing clubs. Mm, loaded, yeah. And so we draw off of that. I'm pretty sure there is some good clubs right here. I have to take a look on that. But uh, but yeah, I, it should be more promoted than what it is. It's, the, it's, it's, it's very old sports and it should be there. It's, it's on the look, you know, nobody would take a look of, of, of fencing pretty much. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I tell you, I can understand it because you have a lot of diversions because mm -hmm. of the weather and everything else that you could do. Here, you find in the Northeast, there's there's got to be an alternative because it's largely an indoor sport. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it occupies that space in weather that's conducive to being inside. Mm. Excellent. Well, we need it here because of the heat in the summer. To be honest, you know, the indoor. Yeah, that's I mean, why you guys play. That's why you got, why I see the lights on on all those fields at night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> and I'd love, I would love to have played baseball 365 days. Oh, yeah. I do. Are we, I don't know if you've been here, coach, before, uh, but spin training, these stadiums are fantastic nowadays. I mean, they're beautiful. No matter what stadium you go to, mm, it's beautiful right there on the, on the freeway. They have about four or five close by each other, you know, the Cubs. Uh, Colorado, Diamondbacks, and San Francisco. Oh, just just amazing. Where where I am now in the county that I live, mm -hmm. we have the Double A affiliate for the Yankees. They just they just all right, we have all right. Somerset Patriots. Okay, it's in Patriots. That's a beautiful little stadium. Nice. And for what it would cost me to park my car at Yankee Stadium, <laughs> I could I can go to you can a game. Enjoy the, the, yeah, yeah. Buy the dinner. Buy the ticket, do the parking. Buy you hot dogs, everything. Yes, and I still have change in my pocket. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Well, coach, before we go, uh, my friend, hey, this is a place. I mean, this has been an, an unbelievable conversation. Same. I really appreciate it, my friend. Um, you know, I know, you know, to close, you know, talk to me. I mean, you, you have gold medals, you know, uh, you know, as a in, in the Pan American. Uh, uh, um, you have, let me see, let me see it. I, I, let me where my notes are. Okay, right here. Yeah, I'm 2016 to 2019. You have gold medal, and then and then you have a few silver medals as well. <laughs> so, and I'm actually, actually, I'm actually as as it, it's interesting. Okay, my first year in the Pan Am Games, and they have them every year. Okay, my first year was in Aruba. I missed out on a medal. Mm -hmm. I one touch. Oof. Mm -hmm. I trained like a madman. Mm. A madman. <laughs> I'm telling you, train like crazy. My <laughs> wife thought my wife thought I had another girl. Okay. <laughs> he thought, where is he going? He's going to the Y to go lift weights at, at 11 o'clock at night. What's he doing? <laughs> I I was fixated and I lost that. I lost that mad that that quarterfinal to get into the bronze medal match to the guy from Florida. Mm. Um, we just happened to be on this U.S. team together and fencing while you have countries, you're still competing. It's, against, it's a against, general tournament. Said, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I lose to this guy 10-9 and I, and I fixated on it. Okay. <laughs> I get to 2015 and it's going to be in Peru. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we went to Lima, Peru to compete in their Olympic facility. And I get, and now I get down there and I'm in the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. And I see on the other end of the bracket is the guy that I lost to in Aruba. Oh. <laughs> I'm going, oh no, here we go again, <laughs> right? And as it turns out, I end up picking up bronze back. Now I'm really thirsty. Uh huh. And 2016's in Puerto Rico, and um, 
And that year, I, in 2015, I had gotten diagnosed with prostate cancer. Mm. And I went through chemo and I went through radiation and I went through, I mean, horrible radiation sessions. And I was, the thing about radiation, it's the gift that keeps giving, okay? Mm -hmm. You get a radiation session in July or August, you won't feel it till the following March. Mm. You get radiation sickness. And that's what was happening going from 2015 to 2016. Mm. Meanwhile, my dad passes on in March of uh, 2016. And, um, and he was the one that was always like, go ahead, keep doing it. Do what you love. Do what you mm -hmm. love. Go ahead Beautiful. and pursue it. And um, so now I said, I say to myself, I said, look, I got to have some, I want to have a reward for myself if I win. If I get a medal in, in Puerto Rico, if I get a medal, I'll get a tattoo. <laughs> okay. okay. So I said, you know, and I, and I, don't, and I start thinking about the tattoo and I think about it. And, think about it. <laughs> and now I'm working out and um, first day of competition, I am horrible. Mm. And a friend of mine from New Jersey, who's there competing in the, in the same division, takes me aside and says, just calm down. Just don't think about the medal. Don't think about anything else. Mm -hmm. Just focus on what you got to do. Mm -hmm. You know, real good advice. W w one match at a time. One touch at a time. Uh, there you are. Says, okay, go back to what you do naturally. Go back to mm -hmm. one touch at a time. Mm -hmm. The next day happens, and I win the first match the second win the third and i keep winning mm. and all of a sudden i'm going up in the ratings and up in the ratings now we start our direct elimination playoffs and i'm beating everybody i get up against this guy i had gone to dinner with and i end up smoking him right <laughs> now i'm in the finals against this guy uh the guy who's the uh who's the champ from venezuela mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay and I knew the guy, very nice gentleman, very refined gentleman, but very classical style. And I decided I got to do something completely off the rails. So first touch, first touch comes and the, the director, lady director says, ready, fence. And I come in and I swipe down. He sees my head open and comes to slice here. I come back up and I take his blade. Mm -hmm. I, I hadn't used that move the entire tournament. Hadn't seen anybody doing that the entire tournament. It's scored on. <laughs> now, my brain starts thinking, and mind you, going into that match, I'm going into the finals, and I'm thinking to myself, well, silver medal's just as good as a gold. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can get the tattoo with a silver. <laughs> and I can almost hear my father's voice saying, you may not be back here again. <laughs> you better go all out. All right? So I get the first touch. I get the, all of a sudden, in a 10-touch match, I'm up on this guy for nothing. Mm. He scores on me. It's 4-1. He goes to score again. I take his parry, and I hit him. And they have video replay. Okay? And I think that I took the, the parry, and I scored before him. So mm. I asked for the video. And she calls it in his favor. So I asked for the video replay. And the judges tell me, oh, the video is broken. It didn't pick up. The oh, really? <laughs> and in the back of my brain, in the back of my brain, I can hear a voice saying, they're trying to take this away from you and your dad. Uh -huh. and I just went crazy from that point on and, and ended up smoking him. And I got to tell you, no matter what level you compete at, when you take the medal stand with a gold medal and they're playing your national anthem, Beautiful. Stop crying, you can't. You can't control. You can't emotion. control that. You can't control that. Yeah. So the next year we we compete in um, where was seventeen Virgin Islands. Virgin Islands. Oh, nice. End up beating the same guy. Oh, really? That, that friend that had taken me to dinner ended up beating him in the finals. Third year, I had from all those years of baseball, I had a shoulder. I had to have a shoulder replaced. Mm -hmm. So on eight January of 2018, I turned around and started fencing left-handed. Oh my! I fenced left-handed before, but 
to see how the baseball skills work. Mm -hmm. You're a right-handed batter. Your left eye is dominant. So I mm -hmm. found that being a left-handed fencer, I could see better. Uh -huh. So now I'm looking dominant the left eye. Uh -huh. And I'm going through these preliminary qualifiers. I'm doing okay, but I'm, 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 I'm losing bouts that I know if I had been healthy right-handed mm -hmm. that I would be able to win. All of a sudden something clicked and I found that it was really good to be left-handed. It was unusual. Mm -hmm. I started beating guys left-handed that I had never beaten right-handed. Mm. I get to I get to El Salvador to compete. And we go through the preliminaries and all this other stuff. And all the guy that I lost to at Aruba for that bronze medal. Uh-huh. Uh -huh is razzing me. He qualified. He's razzing me. Gee, you know, it's too bad. You're only here left-handed. <laughs> and who do I draw in the finals? Oh, man. There you are. <laughs> there I am. Okay. And I put him away. I got that. That, that was so satisfying. <laughs> and he's a great guy. I'm actually going to fence him next, uh, on Friday in an event down in, uh, down in uh, Pennsylvania. But It was so satisfying. <laughs> um, and anyway, so that's it. I mean, it's it's that sort of thing. And it gives you some, if you are goal oriented, nothing sets a goal like putting yourself out there on a competition. Excellent. Yes. Right. It yeah. gets you juiced. Okay. Yes, without a question. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, I I gotta put like I said before in, the, in our conversation. I gotta put it here in my notes. Drew. Drawing it down right now. I'm drawing it down. Going to practice fence <laughs> with Coach V. You, you you come out. You come out. When in two days, I'll have you hitting people. <laughs> no, no, I, that <laughs> that would be tough. <laughs> well, I try. I try. I could do that. I could do that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Anyway, the uh, the the other thing too is is that as I started doing the international events. Mm -hmm. I started getting noticed by the international players. Mm. Excellent. Now they go back home. And of course I make a point, although I'm wearing USA everything, mm -hmm. I'm making sure that when I'm walking around and I'm in a t-shirt, that t-shirt says Drew University. On. <laughs> I own and that. So now they've got the book on me. It's a, re it's a backwards way of recruiting mm. where you Like I have a kid that's on that's on my list for 2022, coming mm -hmm. in in 2022, whose parents are he's from El Salvador. El Salvador, there you are. Excellent. And he said to me, he says, "Coach, I know about you because you beat our local pro." <laughs> okay, and that's why he's been playing to come in in the U.S. Excellent. But you start doing that. Like this year's team had, uh, I think we I talked about before. We had a kid from Panama. Mm -hmm. Kid from uh, Italy, uh, India, uh, Portugal. There you are. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. good, good for international athletes. Excellent. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Not at That's all. That's not bad at all. No, no. And I no, just no. wish I, like I had it. brought in that kid from France, but now he'll be the target. <laughs> he'll be the target. That's true. And, I know, and that you know that. what? I found out that the hardest part, the hardest part of recruiting an international student. Is telling them is is educating them. Educating, yeah. yeah. And educating no. the parents and and managing their expectations as to what it's like to be a student athlete in the United States mm -hmm. and kind of dispelling the myths they heard when they were growing up, mm -hmm. dispelling them in a good way. That look, you may not be making the money you thought you were going to make as a fence, but look at the world of opportunity. Yes. That fencing for us. Is going to expose you. It's going to. It's going to. Yeah, a lot you're going to be in a people. safe yeah, yeah. on a safe campus. Mm -hmm. We're taking advantage of New York and Philadelphia, fencing against some of the best fencers in the world, mm -hmm. and getting a great education in a school where there's a very low t uh, student to teacher ratio, mm -hmm. and where you're going to get to work with coaches that still compete. They still compete. Beautiful, beautiful. No, that's that's something that you know. I you mentioned something important to to 
guide them the best possible. I, like I mentioned to you in our conversation on Sunday, I had um, a, a, a girl from Ecuador. And, and to be honest, you can ask the parents. I mean, I sit down with them soon and I say, this is, this is my recommendations to your daughter. You know, don't think about division one, don't think about division two. Uh, this, she is a very good uh, an, an academics. You know, she, her, she's A plus in her classes. She took the SAT 1280 on the first try. You know, I mean, it's, I mean that's a very good SAT result for, for a first try on an international athlete. Um, and, and in a non native language. Non native language. language. Yeah, non native. And, and I say, let's look only for Division threes. And then today she asked, you know, she got 132,000, uh, no, you know, financial aid help. And the other thing you have to look at is how do they view a college education? Do they view a college education as an expense or as an asset? Mm -hmm. If you view it as an if you view it as an expense, then every dollar is a dollar wasted. It's, it's, yeah, if it's, you view it as an asset, then every dollar is going to build that kid's future. You, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I love that. And, I love that. Yes, and and we tell them, look, you're building an asset. Mm -hmm. That is, they're going to make friends for life. They're going to get a great team experience. Yes. They're going to get exposure to the, to, you know, the high, one of the highest stages of their sport. Mm -hmm. They're going to get internships and, and opportunities there. They'll qualify for some measure of academic scholarship. Mm -hmm. you know, and they're going to be in a safe environment that opens up a world of possibilities to them. Yes. Yes. That, that, that are immeasurable. Question. Without a question. Yes, sir. I love that. I love that. And with that, we're going to close, my friend. Coach. Coach. My pleasure. Thank you.